Good to see you, Sister Joyce. We missed you. Um, we, we need to uh, go to the Lord in prayer about a special request, if you'll stay in right now. Uh, Sister uh, Tina Miley's daughter, Lacey, s developed a bad headache yesterday, a severe headache. And it's uh, continued through the night, and no, nothing could relieve it. Now they have her at the emergency room, and they're doing a lumbar pop puncture for um, possible viral meningitis. And I, we don't know exactly what the deal is, but they are in conflict right now and very concerned and have asked for prayer. So let's just pray that the Lord will touch her, and then we'll, they can find out what the problem is. If we, You'd go to the Lord and pray with me right now. Lord, in Jesus' name, we have dear faithful people that, that are suffering. And I pray in Jesus' name, by the authority of your word, and by the power of the name Jesus, that touch, touch Lacey's body right now. And I pray, God, that you will, you will move on this situation. I thank you, God, for your protecting hand. I thank you for the, the walls of protection that are round about us. I thank you for the power and the strength that is in your name, Lord. In Jesus' name, we believe you. We put it in your hands, Lord. We put it in your hands, Almighty God. Do your work, Lord. Do your work, Lord. I pray you will bless this service today. I pray that you would bless the worship today. Bless our ears. Bless your word. Bless the anointing. God, in every way, let your voice be heard. Let your voice be heard in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we believe it. We receive it. Hallelujah. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your protection. Thank you, Lord. You may be seated. What a beautiful, what a beautiful day and week. And in this crazy weather, every single day, you'll just know it's sunshine. And I'm telling you, where was I yesterday? And I had the top down on my, my car. And uh, I'm like, there is not a cloud in the sky. It cannot. It, it's not going to rain. Would you? Oh, I was in Winn-Dixie. I'd eaten with Sister Angela, and uh, I was in Winn-Dixie, and I'm like, there's not a cloud in the sky. Seriously, I wasn't in there that long. Well, longer than I meant to be. I wasn't in there that long, and I came out, and would you believe the Lord just the miraculously, it had started to sprinkle by the time I got in the car, and I threw the groceries in real fast, and I started putting up my top. It really got got hard. You cannot trust the clouds anymore. You just cannot. I'm just telling you. Every day we have got weeds that are out of control, but we will conquer. Right, Brother Lane? We're going to conquer in Jesus' name. Um, today, I, 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 I'm just so thankful for all that the Lord's doing. I'm thankful for his power in our lives. And, you know, there's so many times scriptures, I don't know about you, but there are certain scriptures that are just in conflict with me. Um, Sister Amanda and I met on Friday, and uh, we talked about this. It, she had a particular scripture setting. She said, this just, I don't know. I, I just don't know about this. And, and she said, I've studied it out. And so we, we kind of talked through it, and we're studying, still studying on that. But um, one of the beautiful things about the Word of God is you cannot ever completely uh, plumb all of its depths. So it keeps us searching and thinking. And uh, it's a, you know, do we ever really understand God and his word altogether? I don't, I don't know that we do. But one of the beautiful things is it calls us into a place where we seek to understand, which is exactly what Jesus is trying to do. When he said to his disciples, it's like, uh, well, they say, well, what did you mean by that parable? And he was like, well, it's not for everyone to understand, but if the hungry know what they're going to seek. They're going to study. They're going to think about it. They're going to pray. And so one of those particular concepts was um, I want to share with you today for, I don't know, I just, uh, Philippians 3.10. I just don't know about this scripture. I don't know about it. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. I do not know about you, but I have not yet got to that place. It sounds so deep and it sounds so spiritual, but I just have to tell you, it's not on my latest prayer list. I tell you what is on my prayer list is Psalm 69, 29. I am suffering and in pain. Rescue me, O oh God, by your saving power. That's on my prayer list. And when I see that, you know, I just often... 
you know how you will think about, you'll read something and you'll like, ooh, I don't know about that, but you just keep on to go to the next verse and the next verse and the next verse. You know, you said, man, the Lord really spoke to me today. But you never go back and say, uh, you know, Lord, I want to know you in the fellowship of your suffering. I'm going to tell you, I have never prayed that, and I ain't going to pray that. Well, I shouldn't say never, never. But I don't plan on ever praying that because, you know, you got to, you, your faith, you get what you pray for, right? And I tell you what, I don't have my hand raised. I don't think any of us do. Now, I do, however, as we just prayed for Sister uh, Lacey, I am praying for rescue. Yes, I am probably the first in line to pray for deliverance from the fellowship of his suffering. I can understand that if it had said, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the deliverance from suffering. But no, Paul said, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Well, what does that really mean? Let's try another translation. Maybe it'll help us. Philippians 3.10 in the NLT says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. Man, I'm on for that. And I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death. Ooh, that is no better. That is no better. I love the power, the mighty power that raised him from the dead. And I really like the thought of when I die, I'll be resurrected. In fact, lots of people buy into the salvation story because of the promise of resurrection from death. But nope, I'm not there yet. Not there yet. Not ready to suffer with him and share in his death. Does that make me sound ungrateful, unspiritual, immature? You know, I look at Paul and I'll say, you know, you were a great man of God. And, you know, I want to have that resilient kind of attitude and whatever. But I'll just tell you right now, I mean, I'm looking at the message version. And it still doesn't help much. He says, I gave up all that inferior stuff. I guess the stuff that worries me is what he's talking about so that I could know Christ personally and experience his resurrection power and be a partner in his suffering and go all the way with him to death itself and if there be any way to get in on the resurrection from the dead I want to do it now to me this translation helps me understand a little bit more at least this one says I just want to go all the way with Jesus even if it means death so I can I can I can swallow that one but really it says what it says. I want to know him. Let's try another scripture that's confusing to me that's equally, seems to be on equal standing as this one, Matthew 5, 11. Blessed are you when they revile you, persecute you, say all bad things against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice. Be exceeding glad for great your reward in heaven. So they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Rejoice? I, 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 I'm not rejoicing, no. And I'm certainly not exceedingly glad unless I'm lying. You know, I mean, I could say, oh, hallelujah, I just praise God for this dark, long trial that I have been through. I just tell you, I've got such exceeding joy. I'm going to run around the church ten times because my husband has suffered for the last man. What joy we have. I mean, really, would you buy into that? So what is there to learn from this? Because it says that all scripture is given by God for instruction, for encouragement, for correction. For It's for our good. Verse 12 helps us a little. It says, rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. So that does help that when we're in the midst of trial... Sometimes our only consolation, our only ray of hope, that, that knot in the end of the rope and the only ray of, of, of hope that we have is that somehow there is going to be a reward afterward or somehow there's going to be some type of recompense for our reward. In the midst of trial, in the midst of dark, long journeys and seasons, it is often our forward look or our backward look that helps us to frame what Apostle Paul's framing here. Because you see, he's sitting in a prison cell and he's hoping for release. Don't tell me he's in there shouting, running around that, that dingy, dark, damp place that they did not have toilets, saying, Wee, wee, what a great it is. I'm just so exceedingly joyful about this suffering that I'm. No, there is no way. I'm sorry, I don't buy it. 
when I get over there, I want him to convince me. And he's going to have to do a lot of talking to convince me that he's doing whoopees. But what is beautiful about that is we have a gift that God has given us. And that gift is memory. And we can choose what we look back on. And he's also given us another beautiful gift. And that is our imagination. Which is where our faith resides. And we can imagine our future any way we want to. In fact, there's many books about the power of positive thinking that has nothing to do with faith. It has to do with you can imagine your future in such a way that you continue to have a positive outlook and you will, that, that will happen to you because of the power of positive thinking. But I'm not talking about that today. I'm talking about that God has given us this beautiful mind for imagination in the future that gives us faith pictures that we can hang on to in the time of trouble. How do you think people made it through the... Uh, uh, horrible imprisonments. In fact, if you read stories about those that made it through the Jewish uh, uh, persecution through Hitler, and you talk, they would talk about, I remembered back when, and I would visit back when, or I would think about a loved one that might be still alive, or I would think about when I got out of here, what I was going to do with my life, or there would be something, because when you are going through that, if, if we only spoke on what we were going through at the time and our feelings at the time, I am telling you, we would be a miserable lot, wouldn't we? In fact, um, I'm going to skip ahead to the psalmist in Psalm 73. He says, Truly the Lord is good to Israel, to those whose hearts are pure. And I'm glad he started with that because I don't know if I would have finished reading his psalm. But as for me, he says, I had almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping. I was almost gone, for I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. Do you ever look around and think when you're going through financial difficulties of the people that don't live for God or the people that have not paid the price you've paid or the people that aren't hard workers or the people that win the lottery or whatever happens to people they inherit all this money and they're 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 they just blow it and they're i was uh seeing a uh picture of a young guy in the news uh, the hilton the brother of the paris hilton who's only known because of their parents that have money and they're in the social scene with all the movie stars because of their association. And now this young boy is following in the same path and they literally do nothing but totally destroy their lives. And you're thinking, you know, Lord, you could sell the cattle on a thousand hill at least a little small part of the herd and send it on down while I'm still alive. You ever thought that? Evidently, that's what the psalmist is thinking here. They seem to live such painless lives. Their bodies are so healthy and strong. Ever felt when you're suffering? You know what, Lord? If you don't heal me completely, I just want to have a body like that person that, you know, is on the dance video. They don't have troubles like other people. They're not plagued with problems like everybody else. They wear pride like a jewel necklace, and they clothe themselves with cruelty. These fat cats have everything their hearts ever wish for. I love New Living Translation. They scoff, and they speak only evil. In their pride, they seek to crush others. They boast against the very heavens. Their words strut throughout the earth, and you're watching as they continue to succeed and even get your promotion that you deserve. What does God know, they say? In other words, oh, yeah, well, I ain't going to church. Oh, that's only for weak people. Does the Most High ever know what's happening? Look at these wicked people. They're enjoying their life of ease while their riches multiply. Did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Have you ever thought that? Am I the only one here that has ever had those thoughts enter my mind? Did I keep my, my innocence for, for no reason? I get nothing but trouble, nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. This is the key here. He said, if I had really spoken how I felt during this time, it's my translation, by the way, to others, I would have destroyed their faith. I'm going to tell you right now, Apostle Paul was writing. This is his fourth letter, fourth prison letter. 
and he's writing, hoping he's going to be released from that hell hole. And he's trying to encourage people that's on the outside that's suffering that there is going to be a reward somewhere sometime. And, and, I, and no, I'm not writing how I really feel right now, but I'm telling you, I want you to know him. We need to know Christ in the fellowship of his resurrection, but also the fellowship of his suffering. Because when we suffer... When we go through it, then we can only know him because he suffered before us. Thank God the psalmist didn't end that there. He said, so I tried to understand why wicked suffer and what a difficult task it is. Verse 17, but he said, but then I went into the sanctuary of the Lord. Thank God for church. Amen. Some of you are thanking God for my teaching this morning. Because I'm talking about where you're living Hallelujah. Okay, let's look at Job. Sometimes it's where a scripture is positioned. You can look at a scripture and think, man, boy, man, I'm just not spiritual. Man, he just let nothing, nothing no death, no life separate me from the love of God. I'm, you know, I'm this, oh, well, my God, he's about to get his head chopped off. He's made it through. When I'm laying on my deathbed. Or my last words and I've helped my faith and, and they're about to shoot me in the firing squad and, and I have made it through all the, the beatings and all the persecutions and I'm about to be cru crucified and I've made it through. Oh yeah, I can say, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. Therefore, laid up for me is a crown of righteousness. Of course I can say it then. But I tell you what, when we're living where we're living today, in this season of our lives, and if you're not living there today, believe it or not, there's a cycle that happens. It just is the way life is. And it rains on the just as well as the unjust. And there were two foundations, but the storms were the same. So this is Job. He gives us some insight here, Job 23. But notice where it's positioned. Job's already had a lot of talking going on. He's had a lot of thinking going on. He's had a suffering going on. Job says again in Job 23, verse 2, my complaint today is a bitter one. I try hard not to groan aloud. Try not to complain here. If only I knew where to find God, I would go to his court. I would lay out my cause. I would present my arguments. Then I would listen to his reply, and I, I want to know what he says to me because I just don't understand this. Would he use his great power to argue with me? Would he give me a fair hearing? <coughs> in other words, is he going to give me excuses for what's going on in my life? Or is he going to give me some explanation? Honest people can reason with God, right? He's reasoning. <coughs> so I would be forever acquitted because I really have tried to do right. <coughs> but he said my dilemma is, in verse 8, I go east, he's not there. I go west, I can't find him. I do not see him in the north, for he is hidden. I look to the south, but he is concealed. <clears throat> Thank God for verse 10. Right. But my conclusion is, Job said, this is what I will say. This is what my mouth will speak. This is my only ray of hope. I will not stop here and die in my dilemma, as Jeff Arnold says. I will not have such a pity party that this is the end of my story. Because this is the key here today. If you came in here, nothing else that I say today, you came here for this wonderful key. Whatever you're in the midst of will not always, you're never going to be in the midst of it. If you keep walking. The only reason we die in our dilemma is because we stop and we die there. I'm going to tell you, I'm not dying here. This is not the end of my story. This is not the way it's going to end up. It's not going to wrap up like this. No, 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 no. I'm going to keep walking. I might not see the next step in front of me, but I'm going to keep walking. He says, but he knows where I'm going. I might not see him, but he sees me. I might not know the way, but I am trusting, even though he's not talking to me, I'm trusting that when he tests me, this has to be a test. Do you know that some people, I have actually had them tell me, you know, really, Christian people always saying, you know, something's a test. Well, what if it's not a test? Well, you know what? Don't ruin rain on my parade. Amen. Amen. Don't ruin my daydream. That's right. I mean, if there's nothing out there beyond this life, don't, don't mess with my faith. Because you know what? Sometimes my faith is the only thing I've got. That's right. 
I'm going to tell you what's carried us through the times when we wheeled my husband out to that window at rehabilitation and we watched the planes come in and out and we would read the word of God and that's what that's how he made it through do you know why he's not in a wheelchair today why he's not bed bound today he's not bound in a wheelchair today it's because he looked to the doctor and said you know what no that's not I'm gonna I'm gonna get no I'm not gonna stay in this condition and because of that, the, the doctor told me, he said, you need to talk to your husband because he's in denial. Well, I understand denial. I understand denial. I said, I said, you know, I have nursing background. I understand denial. And I can understand if a patient is in denial, they won't cooperate with physical therapy. But is my husband cooperating with physical therapy? Yes, he is. Is he cooperating with the, uh, I forget what it's called, but social therapy, how you, you know, scoot from the chair to the, you know, the toilet and the bed and whatever. Yes, he's doing that. I said, well, then my husband is a man of faith, and I'm going to tell you, you can call it denial, but my husband calls it faith, but he is not going to stay in this bed. And I'm going to tell you, I have to say today, my husband's still holding on to that faith. And if it had been up to them, he had to be curled up in a fetal position somewhere and had given up a long time ago, and we'd probably already had his funeral. But I tell you, he's got 20 good years in the, ahead of him, and he, <laughs> and he is not going to give up. <clears throat> woo, woo. And I tell you, I, in the dilemma I'm in, I don't see nothing but sunshine ahead. I'm not planning on staying in this midnight. I'm not stopping here. Woo! If I can just feel the presence of the Lord, the wind of the Holy Ghost, and I'm going to tell you, God has a way of just letting that breeze blow at just the right time. When, you, when you've given up all hope, somebody will come through and give you a word from the Lord. And if we're not careful, we'll go, we'll go don't comfort me. I'm depressed. But you know what? Well, we got to be careful because God's trying to send us a signal from heaven that there's a light that there, that's at the end of the, the rainbow. And you know what? This cloud's not going to be over us always. And the, the darkness, there will come a morning. Midnight's not going to always be where we're going to be. And, and, you know, Job said it like this, when he tests me, I will come out. This is a test, Job is saying. And whether my friends believe it or not, I am speaking. It is a test. This is only a test. And when I come out, I am coming out. I will come out as pure gold. I'm going to be better because of this. i got to believe that. Do you know what? If you, if you go through things, people go through things in this world, and they don't believe it has any reason or any rhyme or any meaning. What is the reason for living? I ask you today. I'm, I'm reasoning with you today. Is there any reason for living if you can't believe that the bad things that happen in your life are going to have a good purpose somehow? The hopelessness of someone whose son overdoses. Pastor Paul had to deal with that this, uh, this past week, I think it was, or last week, where someone in his uh, church, their 21-year-old son, drug overdose or suicide, they don't know which, but... 21 years old. I mean, if you can't somehow believe that somewhere, somehow, sometime, that God is going to, a superior power is going to cycle, recycle this back into your life in some way, somehow, and, and that peace is going to make sense. I'll tell you, right here in this place, like us, Job is fighting for his faith because if you lose your faith, I'm going to tell you, you've lost everything. Jesus said to Peter, you know what, you're going to mess up? Peter said, no, I'm not. He said, yes, you are. But what did Jesus say? He's praying for him. I am praying for your faith. I'm not praying you won't fail. That's not the worst. The worst is not that we fail. The worst is not that we're discouraged. This, the worst is not we have negative thoughts that come through our mind. The worst is not that we go through times when we wonder about our faith. That is not, that's not, the, that's not the, really the worst. What Jesus said I'm praying for is that your faith fail you not. Because I'm going to tell you, if we got our faith, the faith is, uh, that's all. That's it. And the thing of it is, if that's the minimum that I have, that's the greatest gift I have because guess what? That's gonna, what's going to carry me out of anything and everything to believe that all things are possible. Remember um, when Scotty, by the way, I'm so happy to have my little, uh, my little children with me and they're so precious. 
Now, we have to mop the floors more often. You know, you have to have more, uh, well, we don't need more sweets, no. I have to refill the popsicle container more often. But they're such a, just such a joy, such a joy to me. But Scotty, last year, was um, suffering from seizures, and you all know that. And we were there one time when he completely stopped breathing, and it was so, 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 so terrifying. I never hope he never had to go through that. Uh, we were there, and I'll be honest with you, <clears throat> I felt nothing, but I was just totally freaking out. I may not have been saying it. I was trying to calm, be calm, and I was trying to say the right things, but... When Jathan came out of that room with that baby in his arms, and he's like, he's not breathing. He's like, we were all in panic. And my husband is pleading the blood over there in his chair. And he, and then, um, the, then he, you know, came to himself, and and we were all relieved. And I felt so bad that I was so fearful. And my husband said, he said he calls Brother Tenney, and he said, Brother Tenney, I am very concerned about myself. And he told him what happened, and he said, Brother Tenney, I didn't feel one ounce of faith. He said, I was nothing, I was terrified. And I was calling, I was saying, Jesus, in the name of Jesus, he said, I didn't feel one bit of the Holy Ghost, and I didn't feel one bit of faith. And Brother Tenney said, don't you worry a bit. He said, God knows how to interpret our emotions. He said, he knows you're a man of faith. You've built a legacy of faith. He's not worried about your terror. And he's not worried about your moments of, of, of doubt and your moments of fear. What he's concerned about is that's who you called on. You know what? In the time of trouble, we know a name. We know a name. We know a name. We know a name. And guess what? You know what our first defense is? Oh, Jesus. Sister Lisa said as she was holding her husband's head in her lap and she was saying, dear God, she was so afraid and so fearful. She said, I was laying my hands on him and I was trying to pray in Jesus' name and I didn't feel anything. I didn't feel anything. She said, I was scared to death and I was able to share that with her because we've been there. And you know what? God, God did come down and God did come through. And Pastor Jason, I believe, is going to be a richer man for what he's been through. And Sister Lisa's faith is going to be greater because of what we've been through. God heard that. He, he was excited because that was the first name that came out of her mouth. That's what faith is. Woo, hallelujah. My Lord, y'all are fired up today. Or maybe it's me, I don't know. Don't feel guilty because you go through human feelings and suffering. This is Paul's letter of gratitude, and he's sitting in this prison not knowing if he's going to live or die, and he's not handling. This is the only letter that is written that doesn't handle some type of correction or some kind of crisis, and he's just here sending a letter to the people, some of the people he loves the most, because this is the place where he's writing this letter to Lydia, who was, as I taught you all a month or so ago, the first open door into Macedonia, which was into Asia. She was the woman that was a Gentile that was washing clothes by the river. I'm sorry, not washing clothes. It was where they washed the clothes, and she was having prayer meeting out by the river because it was not allowed for her to have church, not Jewish church, inside the city limits of Philippi. So it is this woman who had the courage to have church in her house that he's writing to. Don't worry about me in prison because I'm okay. And when you go through trial, because no doubt they were still suffering persecution, because this is the city where they were put in prison, and the prison was shaken, and they were released from prison. So this is the letter that was written to the Philippian jailer and his family who had been baptized, who were no doubt being persecuted. And this is when he writes, we need to know him, not just in his resurrection power. Oh, yeah, the earth did shake. And oh, yeah, that's great to know him. But you know what? When you suffer... Remember that Jesus suffered as I'm suffering. And we are together partners in the fellowship of his suffering. So today, it may not be that you can say I'm going to run laps around the church because I'm suffering today. But what we can say is be of good cheer. Have faith. And believe and know and be confident that as you suffered you're having the opportunity to suffer as Christ endured suffering. 
And as Apostle Paul endured suffering and fought a good fight. And as those of old, those that are the patriarchs of faith, then in the 21st century, as we suffer with integrity, as we suffer with faith, as we suffer and continue to put one step in front of the other, so we are soldiers alongside that, that Hebrews 11, the hall, the, 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 the anyway, the... the, the Y'all, I'm, I'm 60. Yeah. The, yeah, the, the men and women of faith. I'll think about it 20 minutes from now, what I was trying to say. Let's look at 1 Peter 3.17. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good if it's what God wants than to suffer for doing wrong. So what he's saying here is people suffer anyway. So at least if you're suffering for good, there's a good reason for suffering, right? Okay, let's look at this, 1 Peter 4 and uh, 1. So then, since Christ suffered physical pain, you are, must arm yourself with the same attitude. That means it's not natural. When you're suffering, you arm yourself. It is a choice to arm yourself with these words. Arm yourself with this attitude. Arm yourself with the power of Scripture. It says, arm yourself with the same attitude he had and be ready or be willing or have a good attitude to suffer. For if you have suffered physically for Christ, you've finished with sin, meaning that we demonstrate our spiritual maturity when we can suffer with integrity and a good attitude. Colossians 1.24, I'm glad when I suffer for you in my body, Paul says, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. Like Christ suffered for the church, then I am now suffering for the church. So he was equating. Now you can't tell me that he didn't sit there and think about that a while. You can't tell me he didn't have questions and wonder, now wait a minute, there's a great revival and churches to be built out there and here I'm sitting in a prison. You can't tell me he didn't go through that. He didn't write that. But he went through the same things we go, to, go through. But yet this is the conclusion he came to. Wait a minute. I'm suffering for the gospel. Jesus suffered for the church. Wait a minute. You know what? I think I'll write this in a letter. Because as we're suffering for Christ, then that is compared to he suffered on the cross for our sins. So why shouldn't we suffer Today, as we go through tough and confusing times, I just want to kind of encourage us to train our mouths to speak and our ears to hear there's a higher purpose for everything we go through. Psalms 119.71, my suffering was good for me. Sometimes it is good for us because it is a training in resilience. I don't like it. But I'm richer because of the last 12 years, 13 years. I'm a richer person. I understand what real faith is. I thought I knew what faith was. In fact, my husband has often said, I called myself a faith preacher, but I only preached one side of faith. He preached the first half of the Hall of Fame of the Patriots. There, I got it. I told you all I'd get it. In Hebrews 11, the Hall of Fame of the Patriots of Faith, the first half. Those that received their dead raised to life. But he said, now I've learned to teach and to preach about those that were sawn asunder. And they died in the faith without receiving their promise. Psalms 37 and 25. So what is the final conclusion here? Psalms 37, 25. I have been young, now I am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging bread. The thing of it is, God is faithful. Now, I don't think David would have written this on the day that he was begging for shoe bread because he was hungry when he was running from Saul. I don't think he would have written this on the day that he sent his men to go ask for food from Nabal I don't think he would have written that this day. But this is what he says. I was once young, but now I'm old. And when I look back at my life in review, ooh, God's been good to me. 
Oh, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. I thought it was forsaken, but I was never completely forsaken. Now that I look back, Lord, that you know that time that I thought that Saul was asleep and I thought that I was, you know, really somebody big and bad because I was letting him by for the last time and I really said to myself that I'm going to die by the hands of Saul. Now I look back and it is written in the scripture, the Lord put Saul to sleep. I look back and God, you were was testing me you were about to make me king I thought I was really doing something but you know I thought I was being persecuted that was probably the lowest day of my life because the Bible says that David said within himself I will die you know what I might as well give it up I'm going to die by the hands of Saul. But the Lord has an anointing on your life David and he hadn't forgotten that anointing and one day very very soon he's going to be elevated to the kingdom our hope is that one day we're going to look back and see his mighty hand at work. I've got a song that I want to, uh, one of my favorite songs that I want to read to you today. Nothing is Wasted by Jason Gray. I do sometimes just play this over and over and over again, and I love it. The hurt that broke your heart, that left you trembling in the dark, feeling lost and alone, will tell you hope's a lie. But what if every tear you cry will seed the ground where joy will grow? Because you, because you see, water, the rain that we don't like, is the very thing that brings us food. Then he says the course, nothing is wasted, nothing is wasted. In the hands of our Redeemer, nothing is wasted. Verse 2, it's from the deepest wounds that b beauty finds a place to bloom. And you will see before the end, and this is my favorite line, that every broken piece is gathered in the heart of Jesus. And what's lost will be found again. There's not one single piece of anything that's been shattered in your life that God's not scooping up and bringing along with you on the journey. Because there's a mosaic that you're going to see that's a portrait of your life in eternity. And you're going to look back and say, Oh, I remember that. I have a quilt that's made from my mother's dresses all of us siblings and grandchildren have them and it is so sweet to me on days when I miss her so much I don't know why but I can look at that little blanket and I remember that dress oh, I remember that and then I remember old mom made me a little painter's apron when I was about seven years old out of that right there remember that I don't know on that day Everything's going to make sense. And until then, we just have to trust. That's what really faith is. If you say you have faith to move mountains, but you can't stand there and wait for God to work, then we really don't have faith at all. Because if we have faith to move mountains, but we don't have love, then what do we have? Nothing at all. Like I can lay hands on the sick and they can recover. But then if I don't have love, which the scripture describes there as enduring faith. Because love suffers long. So when we say we love Christ, yet when we go through things with him, we misunderstand what he's doing. And I don't really know how to comprehend it. And it doesn't seem fair. And it doesn't seem right. But true love says but you know what? I trust you, God. I don't understand what I'm going through. I wouldn't have chosen this path, Brother Jimmy Seguin. I wouldn't, you wouldn't raise your hand and say, you know, I want to go through what I've been through the last year. But, you know, today I can say that, Lord, I've seen your hand at work. And for today, that has to be enough. The key today is keep walking. As Paul encouraged Philippi, don't you dare stop in the middle of your mess. Don't you dare stop. Don't you get bitter. You've got control of your spirit. No one, nothing can make you bitter. Only we can choose that. I don't care who we blame. I don't care what situation, circumstance we blame. I don't care how many times the devil will try to get you to put a sticky note on the billboard of God and say, look at what he did wrong and look at how he failed you. And look, at, I don't care how much he tries to lie to me. I refuse to look at that because I'm going to tell you, I feel God's presence this morning. He's shown me this very week that he's alive and well. And he might not be pleasing me right now, but I'm going to trust him until he does. 
I tell you what, I've got a witness in the house today. I, 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 want, I want to just let you know we're soldiers of the cross. We might not enjoy the suffering, but I'm going to tell you there's a crown of life. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Then the writer continues, nothing is wasted, nothing is wasted. And from the ruins, from the ashes, beauty will rise. From the wreckage, from the darkness, glory will shine. Second Timothy 2, 3, endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ. First Peter 3, 18, Christ suffered for our sins. He died for sinners to bring them to safety. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. Romans 8, yet we now suffer is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. Philippians 1, for we are not given only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but the privilege of suffering for him. We are in this struggle together. You have seen my struggle in the past, and you know that I'm still in the midst of it. But know this for sure, that there too is a crown of life for me, but also for you. That endure to the end, just as Christ endured to the cross, to the resurrection. I tell you, I've made up my mind today. My conclusion is today that I've made up my mind. Neither life nor death, principalities nor powers, no trials, no tribulation, no darkness, no light. Because you know what? You can be tempted more by the light and by riches and by wealth. And by there can be more of the goods going on of someone. Uh, what was I saying to uh, Travis this morning? How we talk about, you know, how the supernatural moving of God. And, and you know, we want to see the fire on top of the church. And we want to see the whirlwind. And we want to see the signs, wonders, and demonstration. And, you know, we talk about that. But I'm going to tell you the truth. That man got old within a week. The reason why God kind of drops them here and there because he wants us to keep us interested in him. He wants to keep us pursuing him. I'm going to tell you, I've seen people where God's, they've suffered through uh, abusive marriages and the Lord, would, something would happen with the husband, die or whatever, and they'd backslide. I've seen it happen many times. Not once, but many times. I've seen people suffer financially, kept them on their knees, kept them in the altar, kept them seeking the word, kept them trying to find solutions, and God start to bless them, and they lose their mind. You're like, who are these people? God gives you the, what you desire, and guess what? You know, then it becomes a, an albatross around your neck and the very thing that drowns you. But I tell you today, I've got a mind made up that neither life nor death we're going to make it to the end. We see riches looking back and we can vouch for those coming behind us and walking alongside us and the next generation that God is good. God's in my life. He's working right now. And wherever you're at, Brother Cal, you know what? He knows. And I'll tell you what, when it all said and done, that's why hymns were written that said, It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Our trials will seem so small when we see him. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. I'll gladly run this race till we see him. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Our trials will seem so small when we see him. One glimpse of his dear face. All sorrow will erase. So let's gladly run this race till we see him. Let's stand right now, lift our hands. Lord Jesus, I thank you that we know you in the power of your resurrection. Thank you for the power of the Holy Ghost. 
Thank you for the power of the demonstration of signs and wonders. But I also thank you, God, for the times of deserts and wilderness where you taught us how to grow strong. We flexed our muscles in the, in the daytime, but, Lord, we've had to work those muscles in the dark. I thank you, God, for the trials, and I thank you, Lord, for the sunshine. And whatever comes my way, Lord, I pray give me the faith and the strength and the endurance and the flexibility and the resilience to hold on until the end. I thank you, God. I pray, Jesus, infuse faith in this house today. Lord, you're praying for us right now. You're praying for our faith right now. I want you to get a vision. Jesus is praying for your faith. Lord, I thank you that you're praying for our faith today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I love you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Let's be back in here ready to worship, 1045. And in the midst of that, I want you to uh, fellowship with one another.